The Filipino Experience in World War II by Jim Davis, speaking at the Rosie the Riveter World War II Homefront National Historical Park in Richmond. What I want to do is talk about Filipinos not only in World War II, but before that, because I think it's important to get some background. Um, and to talk about a group that often doesn't get discussed uh, when we talk about World War II, one of the things I did as a teacher, as a lecturer when I was at college, is to, is to approach World War II by looking at different groups. I had lectures on women, on African Americans, Mexican Americans, and I found that this group didn't get much attention and much coverage, so I really enjoyed preparing this lecture, doing the research, so I can share with you some information about the Philippines and Filipinos uh, and their experience during the war. But there will be a lot in here, quite frankly, that will be pre-World War II uh, to try to explain what happened there. Um, I'm going to be focusing mostly on California, but in doing that, that's where most of the Filipinos ended up uh, in this state. So we will be covering kind of the mainstream. What I'm going to be arguing here with this group is that they were, it turned out to be a very challenging group to research and to put this together because of the complex relationship they had uh, with the federal government. I mean, they were a territory before the war, and this is going to complicate uh, migration, it's going to complicate all sorts of things, and it's certainly once the fighting starts, the Philippines uh, and the Americans will be drawn particularly close uh, after the attacks in December of 1941. And that will also change how Filipinos are treated in this country uh, after that attack. Um, so, Susan, can you give us the map? I guess it's the next one. Okay. Great. Um, first thing we have to begin with are where are the Philippines? For those of you who never looked at a map very carefully, the striking thing about this, uh, this particular, this is September 1st, 1939. This was the day that uh, the Germans invaded Poland. Three days later, war was declared. It started World War II in Europe. Um, but we don't have the war in the Pacific yet. We have it in Asia. The Japanese are active in China. Uh, but we don't have the attack on Pearl Harbor until December 1941. But it just shows you the distance we have here. Uh, American defense plans for the Pacific since World War I, going all the way back, was called Plan Orange, uh, the naval, uh, which they did all kinds of exercises and gaming. Uh, the Philippines were central to that because that was always considered to be the threat that Japan would pose to the United States. But there was also um, a recognition that the Philippines, and if you look at this map alone, if that's all you do, you get an idea of what I'm talking about, would be difficult to defend because of how far away they were, not only from the mainland United States, but even from Hawaii, in terms of providing some resistance to an invasion. Um, next picture there, Susan. <coughs> And here, the islands themselves are a remarkable place. There are over 7,000 different islands uh, in the Philippines, several religions. We think of them as Christian, but that's not true. Many areas of the South, where Islam um, is present, many different languages are spoken here. It's an extremely complex country with a complex history. I'd like to pick our story up, though, in 1565, when it becomes Spanish and a Spanish colony. Um, it remained that way until the 1890s. There was a revolt against Spain in 1896. And in 1898, we have the Spanish-American War, in which the Philippines will be very much uh, involved in the fighting. So the next picture, Susan. Now the Philippines gets dramatically changed uh, in 1898. And this is really where I want to pick up the story. Uh, Spanish-American War, the United States goes to war with Spain. Uh, does anyone know who the Assistant Secretary for the Navy was in 1898? Greg. Yeah. D.R. Excellent. Theodore Roosevelt, a very young and pugnacious Theodore Roosevelt, and he ordered the American, once he, f he anticipated war with Spain, he ordered the American fleet to Hong Kong under George Dewey, and he said, stand by. If there's war with Spain, you are to attack the Spanish colony in the Philippines. And that is exactly what happened. Um, the attack took place, here you see the illustration, the Battle of Manila Bay. The um, young American Navy that uh, McKinley had built up, President McKinley had built up to an extent, attacked uh, 
Bay Harbor at Manila. It was a devastating victory for the American Navy. Um, they basically wiped out the Spanish naval presence there. One American sailor died of heat prostration. That is how unequal this whole battle was. The war ends in a matter of months. It started over Cuba, but the Philippines gets drawn in thanks to Roosevelt and the American fleet uh, in the waters of Asia. Here's the problem. Uh, a lot of Filipinos had been supportive of the American the struggle. They'd been struggling against Spain, and they quite understandably expected to get independence out of this. They did not. This man, Emilio Aguinaldo, uh, was leading resistance to Spain, and now he enters resistance against the United States. Um, and very quickly, the United States, uh, the Philippines will become an American territory. They will not get their independence in 1898 as, as a result of the war. Uh, who is this? Anybody know? I'll give you a hint. He still holds the record. He's the fattest president we've ever had. <laughs> Yeah. William Howard Taft, yes. And I love this picture. He is sent to the Philippines to be the first governor general of the Philippines under American administration. And here he is, gamely atop a water buffalo uh, to dramatize his connection to the Philippines. Um, meanwhile, Aguinaldo and his forces now began a war of resistance against the Americans, and the fighting is savage that goes on here. This often doesn't get recognized. So that, that shows you some of the fighting, the American army getting drawn in. A lot of these guys had fought on the frontier. Um, they were deeply racist, uh, and that racism definitely affected their attitude toward uh, the Filipinos. This is where we get the word gook to refer to Asians. Uh, from some of the lingo that the troops uh, extended among themselves. There was torture, villages were burnt, there was, what this is where waterboarding was used for the first time against Filipinos by American troops. Um, it was uh, very serious fighting indeed that went on there. Uh, civilian, uh, the number of civilians killed we think was between 200,000 and a million uh, in that extra, um, in that uprising. The next picture, please. And this was the attitude that Americans had toward the Philippines and toward Filipinos at this point in time. Um, we were going to be an imperial power, this is what the Americans said, to teach Europeans how to be a benign imperial power. We were going to civilize the Philippines. And this is a wonderful picture. I love to use this with my students. Take a good look at this cartoon and the details that you see here. Let me see if I can kind of walk you through it. Um, in the front row, notice the skin color. These are the students who misbehave and who need American guidance. Right there. Native American, struggling to read a book. Notice he's got it upside down. Can't read. These are the good students. Notice the complexion there. The only African American you see doing the janitorial work, right? Chinese <clears throat> waiting to come in. So much in that cartoon. Here is a representation of the United States as it acquires territories as a result of this war. It wasn't simply the Philippines, but Guam. Samoa, Puerto Rico, all of them uh, became American territories um, in this struggle. And so it shows us, this, at this point in our history, the frontier had filled up, the continent um, had taken shape under American control, and so now they're reaching out in the Pacific, uh, symbolized by what happens with the Philippines. Now immediately, uh, Taft begins to try and Americanize the Philippines. We begin to get um, very quickly, Philippine migration into the United States uh, after this war as we go in now to the 20th century. This was actually, if we look at California history now, you should see how complicated this gets. We're going to shift from Pacific into California. The wave of Filipino migration, most of it will start between about 1920 and 1929. It has been called, for people who study California, the third Asian wave. 
Anyone know what the first Asian wave was? Which group? Chinese. And why did they come? Railroad? Gold rush? Things went fine with them until we have the Depression of 1873, and then we get a violent racist reaction in California against the Chinese presence, and we get the, the first legislation in American history to restrict migration based on ethnicity. It's the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, based on California lobbying Congress to exclude Chinese. No more Chinese, we still have crops to pick. The Japanese come in. And we go through cycles of welcoming them in, and then as soon as we have a downturn, we have anti-Japanese legislation that begins to appear. We have San Francisco with a segregated school system against Japanese as early as 1906, the year of the earthquake. Um, and now we have our third wave of uh, immigration. What these people are all supposed to provide is labor in California. And for Filipinos, it meant agricultural labor. Now, Filipinos had an interesting status uh, coming in, and this is part of our complicated story. They were not U.S. citizens, but they were U.S. nationals. It meant that they didn't have the full panoply of rights that extended to citizens, but they did have the right to move about and to migrate. So if we start to restrict migration from first Chinese and then Japanese, Filipinos can come in relatively unrestricted, and that's what begins to happen in the 1920s. In California alone, between uh, 1920 and 29, we had about 30,000 arrive um, in this state. And it was to agriculture. Uh, the next picture there, Susan. Uh, and this is what they ended up doing. They fit right into an ag a California agricultural boom in the 1920s. Agriculture was generally depressed in the United States in the decade of the 20s, but not in California. This is where agribusiness begins to emerge in our state. Uh, about 50% of the nation's produce begins to be produced in California, mm -hmm. and these are the people who are going to work uh, in the fields. About 18% of the California agricultural workforce was Filipino at this point. They were referred to as stoop labor. And again, they were thought to be racially suited to do this kind of work. In other words, to bend over and pick up crops like cauliflower and asparagus and that sort of thing. The crop they were really known for was asparagus. About 90% of the asparagus in Sacramento in that area was harvested by Filipinos at this point in time. They. Um, so what sort of people are these who are coming into the state? They tend to be male, very few women at this point in time, uh, aged between about 16 and 30. Um, the gender imbalance was about 14 male to one female. Um, and this is going to factor in to some of the racial problems we're going to have in California in the 1930s because it's going to involve sex and women and that sort of thing. And so we have a kind of demographic stage set for trouble here uh, in the future. This is, Stockton was one of the cities where a tremendous number of Filipinos went. This is Little Manila uh, in the 1920s, uh, neighborhood of Stockton. Uh, like the Italians, Filipinos uh, loved clubs and social clubs. This is uh, one of them in Stockton in 1939. There were problems from the very beginning. <coughs> Assimilation for one thing. One fellow Filipino immigrant remembered, quote, I have been four years in America and I'm still a stranger. It is not because I want to be. I have tried to be as American as possible. I live like an American, eat like an American, dress the same, and yet everywhere I find Americans who remind me of the fact that I am a stranger. Um, <laughs> there was resistance. This is a typical pattern what we have of these wave of Asian migrations. First, they're welcomed in in large numbers. They provide the necessary labor that's needed, whether it's for building a transcontinental railroad or harvesting crops. And then an economic downturn will hit, and that's when the racism and the pressure to expel the group comes in, and that's exactly what happens with Filipinos in the 1930s with the Great Depression. Now we see 
strong evidence of racism begin to develop against this group. What were some of the concerns among whites about Filipinos at this point? One was um, a kind of resentment at their labor. It turned out this didn't sit well with the growers. They liked unions. <laughs> and along with Latinos, they helped do a lot of militant labor organizing, several strikes in the Central Valley where Filipinos were involved. So they turned out to be not the docile labor group that they were first imagined to be. Secondly, violent crime. They were thought to be, and here they have a similarity to Latinos when I do that lecture. It, it sounds very much the same. They were judged to be biologically predisposed toward violent crime, and therefore a problem with social management. Disease. The Journal of American Medical Association in 1930 concluded that Filipinos were especially prone to hepatitis, and therefore uh, a threat to public health. And finally, the one that would turn out to be the most explosive, the sexual threat. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, okay. Does anybody know, I, when I talked before, no one ever heard this, what a taxi dancer is? What is a taxi dancer? You're looking at some of them here. A taxi dancer is not a prostitute. A taxi dancer is someone who goes to a club, a professional, and dances with you for a fee. <laughs> and Filipino men, where there are no Filipino women around, were known for going to taxi dance clubs and dancing with white women, and we begin to have all kinds of tension over this. It begins to develop in the decade of the 1930s. Um, a judge his name was D.W. Rohrbach in an interview. He said that Filipino males are, quote, the worst part of his being here is mixing with young white girls, 13 to 17. Um, and there began to develop a justice of the peace in Monterey, insisted that the Filipino workers were, quote, little brown men attired like Solomon in all his glory, only a decade removed from the bolo and the breechcloth. We're stuffing the peacocks through the towns to the region to attract white and Mexican girls, unquote. So there was this constant concern here. Um, Filipinos experienced all kinds of discrimination um, as a result of this. Next picture, Susan. Here's an actual uh, hand-drawn note. Uh, this is to a grower that began to try and freeze Filipinos out of agricultural employment. This was an actual note that was left behind. The next one. And a similar one here. Notice the violence associated with this. They were discriminated against in hotels, in restaurants, and it got worse. It turned to violence. In Monterey, December 1929, um, the North uh, Monterey Chamber of Commerce demanded the local businesses stop hiring Filipinos because they were considered a moral and sanitary threat to the white community. In the town of Exeter, in Tulare County, a rioting broke out when some Filipino workers brought white female professional entertainers back to their work camp. And then came the Watsonville riot of 1930, uh, perhaps the most serious incident uh, that we have in our story of Filipinos in the 1920s and 30s. Five days, uh, some whites attacked Filipinos in the Watsonville area. They dragged many from their homes out into the streets. One Filipino man was shot and killed as a result of this rioting. The issues, again, were employment and threats to white women, this sexual stuff. It, it, I, I lecture about um, the Suit Suit riots in Los Angeles in 1943, and very, very similar sort of thing going on there. Dating, this kind of thing, uh, was incendiary uh, in terms of uh, provoking responses. The um, rioting proved contagious. It's, it, there were, uh, after Watsonville, there were uh, uprisings in San Francisco, in San Jose, in Stockton. It got so bad that in Manila, there were counter demonstrations. 10,000 Filipinos filled the streets of Manila to protest what was going on in California uh, at this time. This is some of the highlights. Um, and uh, local newspapers, again, the next picture. Here's a Filipino club that was bombed in Stockton. 
So it, it went even beyond uh, rioting at this point. So. Well, it got legal also, in an odd way. So I want to talk to you next, if you can, in the next slide, Susan. The Tidings McDuffie Act of 1934. This is extremely important to Filipinos and what happens to the Philippines. This was signed by Franklin Roosevelt, and it, um, it had three parts to it. And it looks good when you first see it, but you have to know all three parts to figure out what's really going on here. First of all, it put the Philippines on a timeline for independence, and this, in this way it was celebrated. It said within 10 years, and you can guess what's going to happen here, right? So it puts it about 1944-45 right in the middle of the war, so that timeline is going to get screwed up uh, when Pearl Harbor attack happens. Second, it, put, it considered the, Filipinos, uh, the Philippines to be a commonwealth, which is they deliberately imitated Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and the British Empire. In other words, somewhere between a colony and a fully independent nation. The important thing was the U.S. military was to retain a presence there for some time. And then finally, uh, it took away the U.S. Nationals press, uh, designation that made uh, the migration so early in the 20s and 30s. So now what you could do is restrict Filipino migration. You see how s sinister this is actually below the surface. And what takes place next is the Repatriation Act of 1934, the effort to send Filipinos back to the Philippines from this country. Um, some 2,000 were sent back to the island. They were given one-way tickets. So some of them who went back in, um, with this repatriation act, they said, oh boy, a one-way ticket, I can visit my family, right? Mm -hmm. So they go there and they visit their family, and what happens when they try to get back in? Mm -hmm. The U.S. national designation is gone, and so mission accomplished. In California, there were equal legal battles going on here involving Filipinos. This involves a, a part of California history a lot of people don't realize. We had miscegenation laws in this state. What is that? <clears throat> What's a miscegenation law? Mixed marriage. It's against racial intermarriage, right? Mm -hmm. Did you know we had this in California? Mm -hmm. Starting with the first constitution of 1849, it was written in there. And um, this law was rigidly enforced, mainly against African Americans. That was the original part of the group. So it was actually illegal in California for a white to marry an African American uh, by the state constitution of the miscegenation laws. This was uh, amended in 1880. The word Mongolian was added to the law. This was to keep Chinese from marrying whites. Um, so a Mongolian was a general reference to anyone Asian, so you, you outlawed uh, marriages here. And then we get this interesting couple. So what happens when a Filipino tries to marry a white? What is a Filipino according to the miscegenation law? So it went to court. This couple wanted to get married. Um, this was in 1933. Um, and uh, it ended up going to a Los Angeles court. The Los Angeles court ruled that uh, Mr. Roldan was not a Malay, um, or no, was not a Mongolian. Therefore, the court recognized the marriage. As soon as it did that, as soon as it did that, the California legislature went into session immediately and added the word melee to the miscegenation law, outlawing all future marriages beyond that point between Filipinos and whites. The miscegenation law did not go away in California until 1948. Yeah. Pretty grim, huh? We have riots, we have discrimination, we have in the state level miscegenation laws being enforced, we have repatriation, and this is what I mean about the complexity of this whole subject. Now we get to December 1941, and guess who overnight is going to morph into a hero? 
<laughs> the Filipino. <laughs> yeah. Again, we cannot understand what happens with this group in California unless we are aware of larger policies in the Pacific, larger developments in foreign military policy. They all factor in to how this group is being treated in California and, and uh, how they're being um, reacted to. So we get a wonderful law, the Nationality Act of 1940. This is just before Pearl Harbor. Um, it um, said that Filipinos who serve in the American military can become U.S. citizens. It offered that, a privilege to them. And here are some Filipinos kind of celebrating um, that law when it was signed. FDR issued a presidential order in July 1941. Um, and it put the Filipino military, who keep in mind are still a commonwealth at this point, they're not an independent country, that won't happen until 1946 after the war. It basically put the Filipino military un under the umbrella of the American military. And you probably know who is the commander over there in this situation. Douglas MacArthur? Yeah. By the way, he had a particularly interesting relation to the Philippines. His father, Arthur MacArthur, um, had been involved in suppressing the Philippine, Philippine Rebellion. So Douglas goes over and he becomes a special advisor to the Philippine president. Uh, he is head of the Philippine military. And of course, he'd been the former army chief of staff. So there are all these interesting connections. And so um, the, uh, the, Philipp the Filipino military becomes part of the American military here. The next picture, please. Douglas MacArthur uh, now comes into the picture, um, and the Philippines are attacked. Next picture, please. And this is a, a picture I used to use a lot when I taught the war. It's great because this line that you see is really, really important. This is as far as the Japanese get in December and uh, the early months of 1942 in a stunning, massive attack in the Pacific. Now it's important to realize it's not just Pearl Harbor that gets attacked here. The Japanese attacked Hong Kong. Uh, they attacked within a few hours after attacking um, Pearl Harbor. They attacked the Philippines. Uh, MacArthur was caught completely off guard. In fact, there was one a rare a uh, flight of B-17s, brand these brand new bombers the United States was making that were on the runway. MacArthur hadn't even bothered to protect them. They were all destroyed uh, in the attack. MacArthur is ordered to leave the Philippines. He leaves behind a contingent of American and Philippine troops who fight. And the only word you can use here is, is bravely for a matter of months against an overwhelming Japanese force. Here's the Japanese conquest in 1941-42. Next slide. Um, you probably heard the famous Bataan Death March. This involved both Americans and Filipinos. Uh, it was um, an atrocity, I think, by anyone's definition. These guys were marched for several miles. Many of them were killed. Uh, a huge number of them died along the way. This was a shared experience between Filipinos and Americans uh, in the early part of the war. And here is Douglas MacArthur coming ashore in the Philippines in October 1944. Famously, he said, I shall return when he left. By the way, he left with $500,000 he got from the Philippine government. <laughs> Found out what happened to that. Uh, but he went to Australia and then um, put pressure on the American military authorities to uh, liberate the Philippines, which happened in October 1944. And here he is, uh, filmed coming ashore. Um, keeping his word uh, to return. So what's happening to Filipinos back in the United States? Now they're heroes. This is Carlos Bulasan. Um, he had been a California farm worker, uh, and he tried to express in poetry the meaning of Bataan for Filipino Americans. Bataan has fallen. With heads bloody and unbowed, we yielded to the enemy. We have stood up uncomplaining, besieged on land and blockaded by sea. We have done all that human endurance could bear. Our defeat is our victory. Um, 
Manuel Buakin remembered, uh, he said he got on a bus during the war, Filipino guy, and everybody on the bus stood up and applauded, and it freaked him out. <laughs> it, what's this all about? And it was symptomatic of this radically new attitude. Um, next slide, please. Um, I taught uh, film history, and I had a whole section on World War II, and now the Philippines become an extremely popular subject in motion pictures in World War II. Bhutan, the fall of the Philippines, all of that is repeated over and over in Hollywood film. This is just a sample. I could add many more titles to this. Um, by the way, uh, personal recommendation uh, is to an excellent film if you haven't seen any of these. They were expendable with John Ford, film with John Wayne. Some people call it the best movie made in World War II, but it does deal with the Philippines. Now, the problem with a lot of these movies is you'll be hard-pressed to see a Filipino in the movie. Uh, they're all about the Americans and all the agony they went through with the Japanese invasion. They were expendable is a case study in that. But most of the other films uh, deal with the same sort of experience. Generally speaking, Filipino males rush to sign up for the military, much beyond their numbers in the population. In California, 16,000 registered for the first draft. That was 40% of the state's male Filipino population. Extraordinarily high uh, military service. Next picture, please. And this, I think, is an interesting chapter in World War II, the, the special niche uh, of stewards aboard Navy ships. This goes all the way back to 1901. William McKinley, president, signed an executive order that allowed up to 50 Filipinos at a time to serve in the Navy as stewards, and so they did galley work uh, throughout uh, much of World War II. Next picture, please. And this is something that almost nobody's heard about. They were all Filipino regiments in the American Army, two of them. And I want to talk about this. Um, this, um, on February 19, 1942, uh, Secretary of War Henry Stimson announced the organization of the 1st Filipino Infantry Regiment. Uh, and here are some members of it. Um, quote, in recognition of the intense loyalty and patriotism of those Filipinos who are now residing in the United States. And listen to the, pot, to the flattering language that's used here compared to what we had in the 1930s. The regimental song was On the Bataan. Next picture, please. Uh, and here they are training, um, some of them training. Um, here was the problem. It all sounds good again. Mm -hmm. This was at Camp Beale in the United States where these regiments were training, preparing to go overseas. And when they went off duty to Marysville, you know where Marysville is, maybe some of you have been there before, just in north of Sacramento, mm -hmm. the old discrimination thing starts surfacing again. Even though they're wearing uniforms, there are times when they're not being served in restaurants. They're not admitted to movie theaters. If they are, they have to sit in a designated section. Only this time, something interesting happens. Their commander, uh, Colonel Robert Offley, a Caucasian guy, went to the Chamber of Commerce and he says, if this doesn't stop, we're going to boycott your businesses. We're going to put this in the press, and Marysville will be nationally embarrassed. And it stopped. Discrimination came to an end. This is Evangeline Buell, if any of you heard of her, from Oakland. Um, and I read her oral history, I read a lot of oral histories, and she wrote a particularly uh, interesting one about the trajectory of Filipinos throughout the 20s, 30s, and then into the 40s. And uh, next picture. Yeah, uh, she did. this is a Chinese lady, but this was very typical, because Evangeline Buell talked about this. Asians who were not Japanese wearing buttons saying, I'm not Japanese. <laughs> and Evangeline Buell mentioned doing this. She had a special button that she would wear in public uh, to avoid being. Um... And finally, the next picture. Um, this is what happened with the regiments. This is February 20th, 1943. 1,200 of them stood in formation and got US citizenship simultaneously, all 1,200. Well, the war ended. 
you'd think things would become better now. Until we get another federal law called the Rescission Act of 1946. This superseded the 1941 law that basically promised veterans benefits to the Filipinos because they were incorporated into the American military. The argument was, you've heard this before, right? The budget deficit is getting too large. We have to cut the budget. The estimate was that this would cost to give Filipinos full veterans benefits in the Philippine military and so on, $3 billion, which by the way, in dollars today would probably be about $45 billion. Um, the um, law to save money, Congress completely canceled that commitment they'd made. And they came up with $200 million, which they gave not to the veterans, but to the new Filipino government. You can guess how much money of that actually found its way into the wallets of veterans. But that is what happened. Uh, next picture, please. There was some restitution made in 2009. Um, the injustice of the Rescission Act was recognized in a payment of $15,000 uh, to each Filipino who had served in the military was made by Congress. Um, in 2017, a Congressional uh, Gold Medal was awarded to Philippine veterans, um, and here is one of them uh, finally receiving recognition in 2009. Well, 1.4 million people of Filipino descent live in California today. 260,000 served in the armed forces during World War II. Um, so to understand this group, we have to understand all the complexity we've talked about this afternoon, the changing, shifting status, the complexity of California's economic and agricultural needs, of depression here, of events in the Pacific, and so on. But I hope you've enjoyed this overview. Um, and. Maybe you learned a couple things, I hope, about, about the war. And I just want to say this uh, about Rosie the Riveter uh, and how much I've enjoyed working here. Because it has afforded the opportunity, I think, of re-evaluating the war experience, especially for civilians. And the staff here is very dedicated to that. And so I was really encouraged to do this uh, because it was unusual, because a lot of it was unknown, um, to try and shed light in areas that, that had not gotten much attention or much illumination before. But if you have any questions about anything, I'd love to, to, to talk more about this if you'd like to. Yes, please. Yeah, it's fascinating. It relates to our family. Uh, my grandfather was in the Navy during this period, and there was one moment that I heard about in my family um, of when both my grandfather and grandmother lost their citizenship because he was Filipino, and I didn't kind of catch where that may have been in the story. Yeah, do you know when that happened? <laughs> no, <laughs> but that's what I'm like trying to track back. She doesn't yeah. remember. Yeah. <laughs> but it doesn't like ring a bell like when when they went through phase? Well, they, they lost the U.S. national status mm -hmm. uh, in, in 1936, yeah, uh, the, with, that, with the McDuffie Act, um, which, as I said, it, a lot of people looked at the McDuffie Act and said, great, you know, Philippine independence, right? Which, which it did mm -hmm. uh, put that on. But it also took that national status away, which, which took some protections. Mm -hmm. It enabled uh, that relocation to take place. Um, after that. And then and then they come back with the citizenship thing in 4041, you know, you serve in the military, you can get citizenship. Which also implied the GI Bill in 1944 would be that those veterans' benefits would be available, and they weren't. Um, so we go back and forth here in a, in a very complex pattern. Of, I mean, I, I would think if, if a person was Filipino and lived through this, you'd be dizzy. <laughs> <laughs> With all of this, I mean, uh, the changing status. And, and, and.